please turn back with me to the gospel according to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, reading verses 45 to 52. Just a reminder of the change of titles, having considered yesterday the example of communion with God. We're coming this morning to the experience of communion with God. Uh, Donald John, I think, was maybe the only one who missed that memo, uh, but prayers uh, will be are very appropriate, as we'll see. So let us read God's word at Mark 6, 45 to 52. Uh, this is God's word. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So reads God's word. A short distance from Belfast, there's a coastal town in Northern Ireland called Bangor, popular for its scenic seaside views, its picturesque harbour. Uh, near the harbour, there's the popular Picky Fun Park, apparently one of the top 10 visitor attractions in Northern Ireland, uh, with its play park, its mini steam train, its little golf course, and of course, the giant pedal swans. And it's something of a rite of passage for children in Northern Ireland to, to have a go in these swans, pedaling to their heart's content in the most sheltered pool imaginable, hardly even knee deep. And of course, sadly, as we know all too well, for a great many people, there's this notion that the life of faith is rather like pedaling one of those giant swans effortlessly cruising along in calm, untroubled waters, as if when you're following Christ, the, well, the boat of faith will, will somehow just row itself for you. And of course, we know the very notion is ludicrous. And yet, are there not some who enter the gospel ministry with that very same notion? thinking that by and large, it's somehow going to be plain sailing, peddling the swan. Of course, we would never express it that way, never. But when the winds build up, when the waves threaten, when the storms are prolonged, often our response is one of fear, anxiety, doubt, panic, even astonishment as if we thought somehow we've been ordained into the knee-deep waters of Bangor's picky pool. But that wasn't the experience of Christ, nor will it be the experience of any faithful minister of Christ. It certainly wasn't the experience of these disciples. We left them yesterday rowing for their lives in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, having been forcibly sent into the boat by Jesus. They've been rowing all night and getting nowhere. It's now between three and six in the morning. Their backs, their arms must be in agony. No doubt tensions high on the boat. 
these sons of thunder, what would they have been saying? You can certainly imagine tempers, emotions rising, and at the same time, strength, hopes fading. And where's Jesus been the whole time? Well, he's been up a mountain, praying with his Father. And as we noticed yesterday, as Jesus was praying on the mountain, he could see, he could see his disciples the whole time, no doubt praying for them, interceding for them. What a precious truth to dwell on, the intercession of Jesus Christ. And yet still, even as he prays, the winds continue and the waves continue. And we want to consider this morning Jesus not only praying for his struggling disciples, but Jesus preserving his struggling disciples. Jesus not only interceding, but intervening for them. He not only communes with his Father, but we see him here communing with his disciples, miraculously coming alongside them, stepping into the boat with them, and drawing near, bringing words of comfort, words of cheer in the midst of trial. And it's good for us men to consider it as disciples ourselves, as ministers of Christ. It's good for us to see him here, drawing near, through the trial, even in the trial, and bringing us into deeper and closer communion with himself. The experience of communion with God. Picking up the passage Midway through verse 48, four things to observe about our Lord this morning. Firstly, Christ showing up on the waves. Christ showing up on the waves in their darkest hour, in their greatest need, and in a totally unexpected way, Jesus comes to his disciples' rescue. No doubt they wished he would come earlier. They've been rowing as many as nine to 12 hours. But Jesus comes at his time, the appointed time. Mark tells us between 3 and 6 a.m., just before dawn, and he comes to the disciples, showing up in the most remarkable of ways. And let's not, let's not let our familiarity uh, just lessen the sense of this man. He comes in the words of verse 48, walking on the sea. You will know many attempts have been made to rationalize, to, to despiritualize this whole event. Uh, you have liberals like Albert Schweitzer teaching, well, this whole thing, it must have happened near the shore. Jesus must have been waiting in the, the shallows uh, and the, the disciples in the darkness, well, they've, they've mistaken him for, for walking on water, uh, that the whole thing is, is really just an optical illusion. The disciples aren't seeing things clearly, he's supposing. Uh, and there's nothing in the text to support any such nonsense. Uh, rather, as Matthew tells us in his account, Matthew 14, 24, by this time, the boat was a long way from the land. Uh, John tells us three or four miles from shore. In other words, these are not shallow waters. Uh, Jesus is not still on the shore. Uh, we can't just explain this away. Nor can we simply ignore it. Like William Barclay, who simply passes over the incident with the comment, what happened, we do not know, and we'll never know. <laughs> Is there not a better way? Can we not simply take Matthew, Mark, and John at their word, three separate testimonies, all saying the same thing. Our Lord, he came to his disciples who were out in this storm-tossed Sea of Galilee and he did so miraculously, supernaturally. Mark's language couldn't be clearer. He came on top of 
the water. Clearly, Jesus is doing something no mere mortal is able to do. It's such a powerful image that the phrase walking on water has become uh, something of a metaphor now for doing the impossible, uh, proverbial for describing someone remarkable. Some of you might be familiar with the late Brian Clough, uh, regarded as one of the greatest football managers of all time. No one more convinced, of course, than himself of that <laughs> accolade. But imagine having the ego, the arrogance to subtitle your own autobiography, Walking on Water. The utter pride, the sheer folly. Incidentally, I, I learned recently this phenomenon can occur in the animal world. There's a lizard found in Central America that can literally run on water. Uh, they call it the Jesus Christ lizard. Uh, it's all to do with water tension, uh, special flaps of skin between its toes. And, and uh, these lizards, they can move for about 15 feet by, by slapping their feet against the water, defying gravity, skimming across the surface. The Jesus Christ lizard. But it's much more than that here. Jesus is not defying the laws of nature. He is governing the laws of nature. As Lord of all, he is ruling over all. Mark's already made it clear in, in, in his gospel account. This Jesus, he has authority over the wind and the waves. He's already demonstrated his authority over Galilee before. These winds, these waves, they've been subject to him before. And we do well, man, to, to behold in wonder and awe the miraculous, awesome power of Jesus Christ. And actually, the real issue is not so much how did he do this, but rather who who is this Jesus? That's the question Mark has been asking over and over again. Who is this Jesus? And this miracle proclaims him to be Lord of all creation, the King of all glory, and there is none other like him. And if these disciples only thought of their scriptures, they would have remembered only God. Only God is ever described as walking on the waves. Psalm 77, verse 19. We, read, we sang it earlier. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. Job 9, verse 8. He alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Isaiah 43, 16. The Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path, in the mighty oceans. The only one who has the power, the ability to walk on water is God himself. Jesus is doing what only God can do. And truth be told, this was not difficult for Jesus. This was not a taxing thing for him. Surely it was a simple thing for the Son of God to walk on the Sea of Galilee. Just so, men, whatever your storm, whatever your waves, whatever the winds right now, whatever your prolonged strength-sapping circumstance, you should know it is but a simple thing. A simple thing for the Son of God to show up walking and on the waves, ruling over them all. There's nothing which can stop the Lord from getting to you. Whatever you're contending with, his power is greater. First John 4, 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And at his timing, the right timing, he's able to walk right over the storms. Often, 
using the thing we fear as the path for his feet. Christ showing up on the waves. Let's look secondly then, Christ speaking words of comfort and authority. Christ speaking words of comfort and authority. How do these disciples respond? Did a few of them uh, turn to the others and say, look, I told you, I told you he would come. There he is walking in the water, just typical of Jesus. And then they all drop their oars, they cheer. Uh, far from it. Verses 49, 50, when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified, terrified. These men are beyond frightened. Can you blame them, really? I mean, it would have been incredible enough if Jesus had swam to them. Or if he had suddenly just appeared in the boat with them, that would have been stunning. Here he is walking on water. In their fear, they think it's a ghost. And to be generous to these men, we've got to appreciate they had all kinds of superstitions when it came to the sea. And it was a popular belief then that disturbances in the sea were caused by evil spirits. And let's not forget, strength is failing, and it's dark. The winds and the waves are continuing. So they cry out, they, they scream, they shriek. And in their fear, Jesus speaks to them. These are the only words of direct speech Mark records for us in the incident. Notice how he speaks. He's not harsh with them. He doesn't give them a stern talking to. No, he, he's kind. And he's so tender and compassionate. Verse 50, immediately, there's that word again, immediately, with, without delay, as quick as anything, he doesn't want them to linger in their fear. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. He doesn't actually say very much to them. Literally just five words or so. But you know, there's nothing quite like a comforting word from the Lord. There's nothing quite like the word of Christ when you're in the midst of trial. Whether it comes through the written word or whether it comes through the preached word whether it comes through the sung word or whether it comes from the word memorized. There's nothing quite like a word from the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The comforting, the reassuring, the strengthening words of the one who loves you, cares for you. Fear not. You know, men, as ministers of the Lord, we should never underestimate the power of his word when it comes to helping others, when it comes to ministering to others in their storms. It's a little bit of a case study here on how to go about a pastoral visit, isn't it? Maybe not the walking on water part. But see, Jesus doesn't lecture these disciples on how they should have trusted more. He doesn't go to great lengths to disprove their theories of phantoms and ghosts. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't patronize them. He doesn't dump a load of biblical theology on them. Simply and tenderly, he comes to them. And he says to them, the Lord is here. 
It's okay. Fear not. That's all Jesus does. And sometimes that's all that's needed. A few simple words of compassion and reassurance. Yet while these words are simple, there is a profound depth to them too. They are just loaded with Old Testament imagery, especially those words, it is I. Literally, ego e me. I am. I am. Here is how God identified himself to Moses when he spoke out of the burning bush, Exodus 3 14. I am who I am. And Moses was to say, I am has sent me to you. The ineffable name of God. I am. Here's the God of the scriptures. The eternal, unchangeable, glorious one. Jesus here then, he's not just simply comforting, calming his disciples' fears, but but he's, he's joining the dots for these men. He's revealing something about himself. He's identifying more of who he is. I am. Of course, he does this multiple times in the Gospels. Notably, we have it in John's Gospel. You'll be familiar. The seven I am statements. Ego, e me. The first one, the bread, I am the bread of life, comes, at, comes fairly soon after this event, actually. But Mark comes in earlier with this one. This is Mark's I am statement. There's no need to fear, men, because I am is here. Uh, The one walking across the waters is the same one who met and talked with Moses. he's, He's not only walking the walk of God, but he's talking the talk of God. And evidently, it had some effect on these men. It's at this point Peter makes his famous walk in the water, as recorded by Matthew. Interestingly, Mark doesn't record this event, probably because Peter was Mark's eyewitness source. Maybe Peter was reluctant to talk about himself. Maybe he didn't want to focus on himself, but but upon Jesus. Only Matthew records Peter's actions. But to a man, this whole episode made an enormous impact on these disciples. Matthew tells us they worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus speaking not only words of comfort, but words of immense authority. A little earlier in the passage, uh, this I am statement, it does seem to be backed up uh, by what we read at the end of verse 48. With a, it's an unsettling phrase at the end of 48. Uh, he meant to pass by them. Just take that in. Jesus has seen his disciples in trouble, straining at the oars, wind against them, and Is he walking in the water only to to pass by them? Is he planning to walk on and not stop with them? Or maybe from the perspective of the disciples, that's what it looks like. Maybe it just looks to them as if Jesus is passing by. And yet Mark's language is quite precise. Jesus meant or Jesus intended to pass by. It's not merely the perspective of the disciples. Given what we've seen already and the layers to this miracle, could this not also be another throwback to God's revelation of himself in the Old Testament? Can we not think of Exodus 33 when we read, the Lord passed by Moses in the cleft of the rock and Moses could see his glory, a glimpse of his glory. 1 Kings 19, we have Elijah, the Lord passed by on Mount Horeb. Both cases, the Lord revealing more of himself to his servants, giving encouragement to them, strengthening them, instructing them. 
And then there's Job 9, a little bit less familiar perhaps, but, but very striking. Job 9, verses 8 and 11. He alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Verse 11. Behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. Describing God's transcendence, how high above man he is. In other words, Mark's wording here, this, this strange phrase, he meant to pass by them, it's full of Old Testament echoes and imagery. And when you combine it with the, the miraculous water, walking on water and the ego emi statement, all of it underlining, uh, underscoring, highlighting that what we have here on Galilee that night is nothing less than a divine appearance. Surely on the sea, uh, the glory of God is just bursting through. In the middle of their distress, these disciples, they look and they see the glory of God shining out of the Son of God. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of Job, and Moses, and Elijah. That God has now appeared in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Here he is doing what God alone can do and what man cannot do and displaying his glory to his suffering servants. What a word this is to the believer in trial. What a word this is to the minister in trial. Buffeted and battered by the wind and the waves, this very same Jesus. He draws near in, in all his glory. And he says to us, by his spirit, take heart. Be of good cheer. It is I. It is I, the I am. Do not be afraid. We listen to Christ speaking words of comfort and authority. And then thirdly, we find him stepping into the boat. Christ stepping into the boat. Verse 51. And what's described here is in some ways the most, the most moving and the most powerful scene in the whole event. Verse 51. He got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. Having identified himself, having let them glimpse his glory, he steps into the boat with them, and it's them, and it's only them, that the wind and the waves die down. As amazing as his miraculous walking on water was, as comforting and as powerful as his words have been, we do well to notice it's only when he steps into the boat that the storm Comes. He could have stopped the storm much earlier. From the mountain top, he could have stopped the storm with a word. Before he started walking in the water, he could, he could have calmed things. He could have calmed the storm from outside the boat. But he didn't do any of those things. He walked through the storm in the storm, and while it's still raging, he gets into the boat with these men. And then, and only then, with the disciples in the boats, the storm calms. I am had come to them in their rescue. He's stepped into the boat with them. Communion with God. You see, being with Jesus, communion with the I am, it isn't simply a theoretical truth, man. It's not just something we subscribe to theologically. It has immense practical consequences, one of which here is the peace, the comfort, the cheer of his disciples. 
if separation from Jesus brought them into distress, it's the presence of Jesus which brings them into a state of rest. Communion with Christ is enough. Communion with the Christ is enough to make us of good cheer. Just try to get this in, in your own situation. Jesus stepping into the boat with you. Uh, drawing alongside you in your trying situation, whether it's the pulpit or the study or the difficult pastoral visit, the elders meeting, the members meeting, a church discipline issue, a church dispute just ready to blow up, that fragile church plant, that slow revitalization work. Or maybe for some of us, it's a situation at home. Or it's the hospital ward. Or it's the waiting room. Or it's the graveyard. See with the eye of faith this morning, the great I am. He's in the boat with you. No one else in all the world can step into your boat. Not really. No wife can ever do what Christ is doing here. No elder, no friend, no preacher, no doctor, no Puritan, no angel can replicate this. Only Emmanuel. This same Jesus is our Jesus. One of the most powerful sections in John G. Payton's autobiography that describes his experience one night of hiding in a tree while he was a missionary to the New Hebrides uh, Islands in the South Pacific. The year was 1862. Hundreds of frenzied natives were hunting after his life. A friendly, a friendly chief urged him to, to flee under cover of darkness and hide in a large tree. From this tree, Patton, Peyton saw and heard the natives beating the bushes, frantically searching for him. He writes, I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages. Yet I sat there on one of the branches, safe in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul. Alone, yet not alone. My comfort and joy sprang from the promise. Behold, I am with you always. Isn't that it? Isn't that it? Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul. Alone, yet not alone. Christ stepping into the boat. I wonder if you've noticed Psalm 23 making the very same point. It's in the valley of the shadow of death that we experience the nearness, the closeness of the shepherd. In the opening verses of the psalm, you have David talking about the shepherd. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, he says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. But in verse 4, pronouns change completely, and he speaks to the shepherd, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You, language much more intimate, because you see the valley, the treetop, the boats, they, they bring us into closer fellowship, closer communion with the shepherd. Of the people of God not often find this to be so. 
before the valley, we might talk about the good shepherd. But when you're in the valley, you talk to him. You talk to him. Maybe that's one of the reasons for the treetops of Pitten, the dark valleys of Psalm 23, and the prolonged storms of Mark 6, that we might be brought closer in our communion with him. He steps into the boat with these disciples, and it's then the experience, the sweetest, most intimate communion with the Lord. How precious, men, when he steps into the boat. He shows up, he speaks, he steps into the boat, and then fourthly, we see him, Christ, searching all our hearts. Christ searching all our hearts, verses 51 and 52. Mark tells us the disciples were utterly astounded, literally amazed beyond measure, out of their minds, their minds just blown with this whole thing. Uh, and their amazement, it wasn't actually a good thing, Mark suggests. Uh, they weren't so much impressed, but rather bewildered, bewildered beyond belief, as if they shouldn't have been so utterly astounded. Uh, Mark attributes uh, their astonishment to their hardened hearts. Verse 52, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Remember, they had just seen him feed the multitude, but they hadn't drawn the right conclusions. We have a phrase, the penny hadn't dropped. They, they didn't get it. They hadn't put two and two together. How slow they were. And even in the midst of the storm, it never crossed their minds to think of the loaves. They should have understood that the one with whom they had to do was God incarnate, the one who could take a few loaves, a few fish, and feed thousands and thousands of people, but they haven't totally got it. They realized something amazing had taken place, but they'd failed to grasp what that miracle was saying, what it was teaching, what it was revealing about Jesus. Had they grasped the true significance of the feeding of the multitude, they should have almost expected Jesus to come and help them. Certainly, they should have instantly recognized him. They ought to have realized Jesus was both willing and able to deal with the situation. Already in these six chapters, Mark has recorded 11 miracles. 11 miracles, one of which was already calming a storm. They should have known he is more than able for this situation. And yet these men who have seen so much, they've been so privileged, they find their hearts giving way to fear and doubt and panic. We see ourselves in these men. How little they've taken in how quickly they have forgot, how often we fall apart in a time of crisis, and how patient Jesus is with them. Isn't this the kind of attitude we're to have as pastors? Patience with those who are slow, so slow to get it, so slow for the penny to drop. Don't get me wrong, there's faith in these men, these disciples. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus has sent them out to preach the gospel, to heal the sick. They have faith, but it's weak faith. They don't share the deadness of the scribes and the Pharisees. For all their failings, they do have faith. But there is so much more to Jesus than they've grasped. Penny hasn't fully dropped as to who he is, as to his glory, his majesty, 
his authority. He's the God who walks on the water. They are that mixture that we so often are, that mixture of faith and hardness, that mixture of belief and unbelief. How many times, men, have you and I, we've seen the Lord answering our prayers, meeting our needs, sustaining us through trouble? How much teaching have we received? How many books have we read? How many conferences have we been to? How much understanding have we been given? How many privileges we have? Yet how faint-hearted we often are. How calloused our hearts. How meager our faith. How slow our belief. Jesus is so patient. He is so gracious. And today he still draws near to foolish, fretful, fearful ministers. He still draws near to those who are slow of heart and weak in faith. And this morning, standing in the boat with us, he searches our hearts. He asks us, have you understood yet who I am? Will you not take heart? Do you appreciate who I am? Because when we know and when we appreciate the presence of the Lord, that's when we're removed from our state of fear and our state of doubt. And we're left with awe and reverence and wonder. Because after all, there is nothing quite like communion with God to melt cold, hard, calloused hearts. Whether in the treetop, the valley, the storm. Alone, yet not alone. Amen. We pray together. Sovereign Lord and loving Father in heaven, I we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son, the Word incarnate. We thank you for this awesome display of his glory, might, power, and authority in these words. And Lord, how we see ourselves in these disciples, so slow of heart, so foolish and fretful and fearful, so quick to forget what you've done before. And oh Lord, we pray that in the trial, whatever situation we find ourselves, Lord, that we would see the Lord of glory drawing near through his word, and by his Spirit, stepping into the boat with us, the great I am. And, O oh Lord, we pray that our communion would only be sweetened and deepened and strengthened, that it might melt our cold, hard hearts. O oh Lord, encourage us and refresh us. And, O oh Lord, spur us on in the work, remembering that though alone, we are never alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.